Yeah, sorry. Okay, so let's talk about the biceps tendon. And you all know that it primarily uh, attaches to the uh, glenoid superior to the, uh, to, to the superior labrum. And there's a lot of congenital variations in exactly the association between the biceps tendon and the labrum, whether they're actually uh, fused, whether they're separated and so forth. Sometimes there are also these little uh, rootlets that come out on either side, which we have never been able to see on MR. We usually just see the central attachment superiorly, which we'll talk about. Uh, the tendon goes through the joint space. Uh, and it becomes intraarticular uh, right as it enters the intertuberous groove between the lesser and greater tuberosities. It's held in place by the transverse ligament here, which we already described earlier today. is a con continuation of the superficial fibers of the subscapularis tendon. Uh, and then it becomes extra caps are out here more proximally and goes to the musculotendinous junction. So that's a long head of the biceps. Uh, here's a typical appearance. Here's one where we do not see a separation between the superior labrum and the biceps. Often we'll see a nice little white line separating the two. And then depending upon the rotation of the humeral head, uh, you may or may not see the biceps tendon longitudinally here on the, in the coronal plane. This is someone who's pretty uh, extensively externally rotated, uh, and we can see the biceps. I'm not picking, John. I'm sorry to interrupt. I don't have any images. My fault. Sorry about that. Thank you, John. Thank you. Okay. So here we can see the, the, the superior attachment of the biceps tendon, the labrum underneath it, with no separation between the two, and here an external rotation we can see longitudinally the biceps tendon uh, going out in toward the intertuberous groove. On the sagittal images, the attachment of the biceps tendon is, is superiorly here, superior to the, uh, to the, to the labrum. It's, uh, in this same area, the superior glenohumeral ligament can come in and attach. That's what we're seeing here. And there's the origin, that, that's the attachment side. Belonging here to the biceps tendon, we can see it's immediately adjacent uh, to the supraspinatus muscle, muscular tendinous junction here. And if we go farther out, we can see here's the biceps tendon, the intraarticular portions of the biceps tendon. Here it's just beginning to dive into the intertuberous groove, where it will then go distally to go to the musculotendinous junction. In the axial plane, the, the biceps tendon should be black, oval in shape, and well positioned uh, in, the, in the intertuberous groove here. Uh, Let's see, uh, who was next? J Jonah, uh, what do you think of this particular case? Okay, and it looks like uh, desktop mode is uh, up and running uh, oh, me nice. now, so. Nice. Yeah. Like, um, so we're on the topic of the biceps tendon. There's uh, some kind of irregularity and uh, signal abnormality where I would expect it to be. Um, okay, so here we really don't see a good intertuberous groove. On this no. actual image, I don't see a biceps tendon. And so if we, have, mm -hmm. if we don't have a groove, then I'd be suspicious for a congenital absence. Yeah. Than and so here, we, this, is, this isn't really a discrete biceps groove. This is just kind of flattening of the anterior aspect of the humeral head. We don't see a tendon there. Whoops. And at this location, we don't see a... Here's the subscapularis insertion. There should be an intertuberous groove right in here, or bicipital groove, which isn't there. And this was a congenitally absent biceps tendon. Uh, and uh, the only really way, I think, to make that diagnosis is that you, you see neither the development of the intertuberous groove, which requires a biceps to develop it, and you don't see biceps tendon. If you see the uh, defined intertuberous groove but no tendon, that's almost always a tear of the tendon and not congenital absence. Okay. Uh, what do you think of this case, Dan? 27-year-old female uh, professional volleyball player with shoulder pain. We have an axial, um, looks like a T1 image with arthrogram. Uh, we have what it looks like two heads of long head of biceps tendon, which is probably a congenital variant of uh, being called like bifid, I guess, or or vincula. Attachment to the biceps tendon to the 
synovium, you can you can see typically if you look carefully on good quality images, these are called the vincula, and they're really a synovial attachment of the biceps there, and this is a congenitally bifid biceps tendon. And when you have congenitally bifid, you'll see two vincula. If you have a longitudinal split tear, you'll only see one vincula. Okay. Shali, what do you think of this case? A 43-year-old male with shoulder pain, multiple PD fat saturated images, um, and the patient has had an arthrogram. And so on the first image in the top left, I see a low signal intensity within the region of the bicipital groove. The second one over, I see that it's coming over. Um, and then... I don't see it continuously. Yeah, and then there's this abnormal low signal intensity uh, between the humerus and the anterior glenoid. But on the first image, there's also something there. So that could be, so there's, it could be the, uh, the labrum on, the, the red arrow may be pointing to congenital variant of the labrum versus... Now, uh, this is an anteriorly dislocated long head of the biceps tendon uh, sitting in here. We'll, we'll look at more of these so you can take a look at these. This is actually a, a torn subscapularis tendon, which allowed the, the long head of the biceps to dislocate immediately into the joint space. This bite structure here, if you look carefully, you'll see it on almost all, uh, uh, all MRIs. And it's a separate structure that's in the intertuberous groove, separate from the long head of the biceps tendon. It's called the accessory head of the biceps brachii, and it actually attaches to the humerus here. It doesn't come over and attach to the glenoid. And so when you go back and start looking at shoulder images, look carefully, and you'll frequently will see this accessory head. We typically ignore it because it's not really uh, clinically very important. But in this particular case, it can, it can, a case like this, it can lead to confusion between uh, thinking that this may be a part of a long head of biceps tendon when in actuality the biceps tendon is dislocated in this place. So that's the accessory head. The accessory head comes up here and attaches to the bone here. The long head goes over through the, through the joint space and attaches to the uh, superior glenoid. And here are just some other examples. Uh, looking at the histology uh, and what the imaging can look like for the accessory accessory head. Okay, uh, and here we can see the long head of the biceps tendon with some increased signal intensity within it, a little bit of fluid in the and the sheath. But then remember that the this sheath communicates with the uh, with the glenohumeral joint space, so it's common to have fluid in the sheath here without any pathology. But here we can see an abnormal increased signal intensity, and some splitting of the biceps tendon. So that's a um, tear. And here you can see a longitudinal split tear in the biceps tendon on the other images. And again, here we can see a little bit of subluxation. It's not deep in the well like it's supposed to be. We can see it's somewhat flattened. It's not oval like it's supposed to be. And we have increased signal intensity within the tendon uh, compatible with with a partial tear and severe biceps tendinosis. Uh, so this really gets us to the area of, of sling anatomy. And uh, so here's the uh, pectoralis muscle with its tendon coming across here, and the supraspinatus coming down through here, and then the uh, uh, inner tuberous groove. And here we can see this, that transverse ligament coming across here, which helps hold the biceps tendon uh, in place. And then there's also coming in the same area is a coracal humeral ligament coming across, all of which helps stabilize the long head of the biceps tendon and the inner tuberous groove. And this is just, when you take the muscle up, this is the area there. This is that transverse ligament complex uh, helping to hold the biceps tendon in place into the inner tuberous groove. If you remove it, there's the groove where the tendon uh, is located. And if, Go to the sagittal images, we can see a lot of the same anatomy. 
Here's just the there's the biceps attachment to the superior glenoid. Here's the labrum underneath it, and then we can see the biceps tendon comes off here, goes intraarticularly uh, th into the inner tuberous groove, and then it becomes extraarticular. Uh, now, part of the ligament. So, so we just showed examples of the transverse ligament, help, which helps hold the biceps tendon into place. Another important structure is the superior glenohumeral ligament which attaches to the glenoid just anterior to the long head of the biceps attachment. Then it comes anterior to the biceps, uh, folds itself underneath it, and then uh, and then it comes under and attaches to the humeral head. And this is the, the primary sling mechanism to help hold uh, the biceps tendon uh, superiorly so it doesn't subluct medially and, and out of the inner tuberous groove. So when you see the biceps tendon, which is... Uh, dislocated into the joint space, then the, the superior glenohumeral ligament has to be torn, and uh, you also have to have a tear of the transverse ligament if it goes superficial to the uh, subscapularis muscle, and the, the deep fibers of the subscapularis tendon if it goes deep to the subscapularis muscle, which we'll talk more about. And this just shows how the superior glenohumeral ligament comes around and helps support the biceps tendon. Uh, in a so-called sling mechanism. And above it is the corcohumeral ligament. Here's the corcohumeral ligament here. Uh, and in this case, the, the, uh, and we can see here, if we, uh, if we try to, uh, it doesn't move. So here's the corcohumeral ligament up here. Uh, at one level, the superglenohumeral ligament is, is uh, just underneath the corcohumeral ligament. Then it comes around and comes under the biceps. So here we have the corcohumeral ligament, superior glenohumeral ligament. In this particular case, is abnormal in that location. There's the corcohumeral ligament, but there's the corcohumeral ligament long out of the biceps tendon, and the superior glenohumeral ligament uh, here, which folds under uh, to help support it. So here's just another example. Here is the insertion point of the long head of the biceps tendon on the superior glenoid. Here we can see the long head of the biceps tendon, corcohumeral ligament. Here's the superior glenohumeral ligament coming around here. And this is the sling mechanism that tries to hold the biceps tendon into place superiorly. And you can typically see this anatomy pretty well in about half of the shoulders. The other half, we can't completely see this anatomy. And I think there's some variability. It also depends on exactly where the slices are positioned. So some of it is technique. And then when you go far enough out, then you go beyond the superior glenohumeral ligament. And we're now past the sling mechanism. We just have the corcohumeral ligament there. And then the biceps tendon goes into the inner tuberous groove here and then extends further. Here's just another example of the, of the sling mechanism of the superior glenohumeral ligament biceps tendon here another patient. And here's one where there's actually a tear with anterior subluxation of the biceps. John, um, I'll, I'll make a comment. It's one of the most difficult uh, things uh, to, to visualize in three dimension. Uh, it, it would be really nice to have an MRI in three dimension to, to, to see the sling mechanism. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or uh, don't I have a shoulder model um, up on, on the bookcase? Yeah, there, I think there is a shoulder model in the bookcase. but um, That might be something to look at for this fellows. That's a good idea. So here's just another example, another diagram of it. Corcohumeral ligament up there, superior glenohumeral ligament underneath here. You can either have a tear of the corcohumeral ligament there, or the superior glenohumeral ligament back here. And both of them then would allow the biceps tendon to sublux anteriorly. And we'll see the examples. So that gets us really into instability of the biceps tendon. And what I think I'd like to do at this point is stop here uh, and uh, start fresh going through. Uh, the, the different grades of biceps instability. Because we don't really have time to get through this now, so let's wait and we'll do that uh, next week. Okay. Any questions at this point? 
All right. Well, everybody have a good weekend. Well, you too, John, and everybody else. Thanks. Thank you.